Shmar. God is with you. Also with you. Welcome to chapel. Glad that you are with us, those of you who are in the room. Those of you who are on Zoom, glad that you are with us as well. It's good to see your faces and uh, see you with us. We know that there are some of us uh, on Facebook as well, and we can't see your faces, but we're still delighted that you're here uh, with us this evening. Chapel's set up a little different. Uh, those of you online uh, can probably see. Uh, we're in a square, and the table's off to the side, and we are just sort of looking at each other uh, this evening and the possibility that we may encounter uh, the risen Christ in one another. Amen? I invite you to uh, let go of things that are uh, gnawing at you, things that are pestering you, and take a few minutes. See? Things that pester you. <laughs> um, I, I love the... I love the pastors who say, that better be God. Um, <laughs> it's Carla, close enough, exactly. <laughs> Friends, welcome. Glad you're here. Let us enter into worship together. A very familiar song, and if it's not familiar to you, once you hear it, feel free to sing along. Together, let us pray the opening prayer responsibly and be found on the screen. <clears throat> Loving, merciful God, we are called to your house to worship and receive the gift of grace. As we gather in this sacred space, we acknowledge all that can distract and exploit. Call us Call, God calls upon us to cleanse our houses of all that does not spring from God's love. Together we give ourselves in worship and right relationships with our neighbors. Come. Amen. 
Let us worship God. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you raise it up in three days? But he was not speaking of the temple, or he, but he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Let us say with unmuted voices all together, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Amen. Thank you, Karen and Gabriel. Thank you for all my friends from Columbia that are here in person and on Zoom. And for Dev being here, it's just, I'm, I'm so touched that you're all here with me. I'm, it, I really appreciate your presence. All of you besides, too. Last week when I was watching, I wished I would have been here to be able to give Michael a pair of glasses. <laughs> he left his reading glasses at home, evidently. Will you please join me in the spirit of prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus' disruption at the temple, the subject of our scripture today, appears in all four Gospels. But the Gospel of John places it near the beginning, right after Jesus changes water into wine at the wedding at Cana, and during Jesus' first pilgrimage to Jerusalem during his ministry, while the Synoptic Gospels all place it during his final uh, pilgrimage. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus' disruption at the temple was the precipitating event for his crucifixion. In John, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead was a precipitating event. Until the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in 70 CE, it was, in Jewish faith, God's permanent dwelling place, a physical sign of God's covenant with God's people. During feast times like the Passover, Jews made pilgrimages to the temple in Jerusalem, often traveling great distances to do so. The temple priests had allegiance not to the Jews, but to the Romans who appointed them and they shared in the spoils of the corrupt practices of temple trade and money changing. It wasn't feasible in many cases for Jews traveling long distances to the temple to bring cattle, sheep, or birds with them for the required sacrifices. Instead, they had to buy them from the sellers of the temple who could command unreasonable prices because what other choice did they have? They were a captive market. And they couldn't take Roman coins into the temple with graven images on them, so they had to exchange them for shekels, often at a very unfair exchange rate. So yes, there was corruption in the temple. But was Jesus' disruption simply about corruption? 
After all, as a Jew, he had been, most certainly had visited the temple many, many times throughout his life, experiencing the same conditions many times before. So it's not as if he could have arrived that day at the temple and thought, what are all these animals and birds doing here? And these money changers and merchants, how did they get here? What's going on? Because none of this would be, have been new to Jesus. One way to look at the scene in, the, in John's Gospel is a wonder about how it invites us to examine the relationship between religious life and civil life. It, is, it isn't simply, it simply wasn't possible for many of the Jews of Jesus' time to enter the temple and make the necessary sacrifices without engaging with that civil system, that often corrupt temple system controlled by the Roman occupiers. So there was a tension between religious life and civil life at that time and as there is today. How might we think about that tension? How do the religious and the civil coexist in us? When might our Christianity cause us to challenge civil authority? What do we do when civil laws go against our Christian values? And what do we do when the line that separates church and state becomes, to blur becomes blurry? We have plenty of examples of Christians responding to these kind of things. We all know Harriet Tubman's story. She led enslaved people to freedom before the Civil War and lived with a bounty on her head because of it. But she was unwilling to stand by while people were enslaved and in danger. Archbishop Oscar Romero advocated for human rights in El Salvador. He fought government oppression and showed a preference for the poor and the marginalized. As a result of all of this, he was assassinated in 1980. Shabazz Bhatti was Pakistan's Minister for Minority Affairs. Bhatti publicly defended the rights of religious minorities, especially Christians, in a majority Muslim country. For this, he was assassinated in 2011. Corrie ten Boom and her family helped nearly 800 Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. After the war, she returned home to the Netherlands and set up a rehabilitation center for concentration camp survivors. Even after the war was over, she remained committed to solidarity with these survivors. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a Lutheran pastor and a noted theologian. I'm sure we've all read his work here in, in seminary. In 1945, the Nazis executed him for taking part in resistance against Hitler and for his Christian convictions and public witness. Despite the threats to him, he faithfully resisted Nazism. And for a more contemporary example, John Deere, He's one of my favorite Christian authors. He's a Jesuit priest who's dedicated his life to peace and nonviolence. He's been arrested more than 85 times, and that's an old number, it may be more than I know, for nonviolent civil disobedience. It might be easier for him to engage in safer forms of ministry, but he continues to be an unflagging advocate for peace in the world. In 1993, he was arrested for hammering on an F-15 nuclear-capable fighter bomber a symbolic act of beating swords into plowshares. Hmm. For this, he faced a potential 20 years in prison and eventually spent nine months in jail and two years in hot house arrest. And he's spent plenty of other times in jail cells too for his work. These are big shoes to fill, aren't they? All of these are examples of Christians taking action based on their beliefs and values against governments, trampling human rights and persecuting, marginalizing, even killing people with their policies and actions. What they all have in common is faithful solidarity with the people they serve or served. As for breaches in the separation of church and state, despite what our Constitution says on the subject, they seem to be more and more common these days. We now have a Speaker of the House, second in the line of succession to the President, who says that the separation of church and state has been misunderstood. It's actually a one-way street intended to keep the government out of religion, but not the other way around. Attend any local government meeting and you're likely to see that it includes a prayer at the beginning. And at least in the Midwest, it's extremely unlikely that this can be anything other than a Christian prayer. In the 1990s, I served on the city council. Meetings always opened with a prayer, a public prayer. The mayor invited a different pastor every, week, every meeting to say the prayer. All Christian, all the time. I told the mayor I didn't think that we, it was proper to have pr prayer at a public meeting. He disagreed. And then I asked him if he'd be open to other prayers, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Wiccan. He was aghast at that idea, of course. In the end, I achieved a partial, very unsatisfactory victory. He agreed to have the prayer first, then gavel in. 
So technically, the prayer was not part of the meeting proper. Yeah. The Supreme Court has made a number of recent rulings that chip away at the separation of church and state, from ruling in favor of public funding for religious education, to prayer in schools, to ruling to allow a Christian group fly a flag bearing a cross at Boston City Hall. Our highest court is shrinking the impact of the Establishment Clause. So what are we to do? What tables might we overturn so that our religious life and our civic life maintain their proper, proper balance and integrity? So that we can affirm and live out our own faith while honoring and celebrating every other person's right to live out their faith or no faith at all. Well, we can turn to Jesus for an example. We can have a preference for the poor, the oppressed, and the marginalized. We can work for equality, starting by being willing to relinquish our own privilege and commit to true solidarity with and service to others. We can push back against abuses of power and government overreach, advocate for legislation that is just, and advocate against legislation that is unjust. We can work for climate justice, knowing that it is not us who suffer the worst climate change effects, but the most vulnerable here and around the world. We can grow our own Christian public witness, demonstrating that the kinds of Christianity that condemn, that deny the humanity of others, that close doors and exclude people, are not the only kinds of Christians that exist. That there is another faithful way to follow Jesus. And while we're at it, we might seek ways to have our voices amplified in the public sphere. Basically, we can do what Jesus taught us to do, to love our God with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's as simple as that and as complicated as we want to make it. Yes, the world has plenty of problems to solve, but none of us has to solve them all. We just need to start where we are and work from there. But no matter where we start, what we do, and who we serve, we can be confident that God is with us every step of the way. Amen. There's a beautiful hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Uh, the words will be on the screen, and I would love for you all to sing along with this. everybody who joined us online we had a few more people show up during the during the service so yeah, hi, Carol, Mari, Brian, Karen, <laughs> Marcella. Oh 
Oh, and Sharon. Hi, Sharon. <laughs> you all go in peace, too. Thanks.